All right, friends. So we're going to take another step in our work with what we call at the pre-seminary of the Christian community in Toronto, the seven I activities of Christ. The seven priestly activities of Christ Jesus, who is the high priest, Jesus. And he can also, he's also longing to come alive in your self, in your being. Because when we look at Jesus, when we look at Christ Jesus, not only do we see the highest God acting, we see our true self. This is the great mystery. This is actually the task of the Christian community, movement for religious renewal, this movement, which is to begin something in what's called the new mysteries, the mysteries of the eye, to begin, plant a seed of learning to see and behold and know Christ Jesus in his present reality as the bearer of your true self. We are just barely beginning. What does that even mean? How can another being hold my true being? That means if you want to be in relation, if you want your true self, you have to be in relationship. It's like, what? what? Normally we think, oh, my true self is right here. It's like somewhere deep inside of me. Nope. It's in him. And yet he has died into you as a seed. You see, you can't get too fixed on one thing. Christ in you is a seed and a relationship. A seed in the soil of your unconscious, if you want to use a psychological term, that has to grow. And Christ is also an other, not you. that you are called to be in relationship with. But not just in relationship, you, you see, because you can go to lots of different churches today and learn about how to be comforted by another. Many humans have a relationship with Christ as the comforter. Many, many, many humans. But not so many, and that's our specific task, not so many, and that's just beginning, and it's going to have to be a seed for the next while. Not so many, when they feel and see and know Christ as other, feel and see and know their true self, identify with him. You see the difference there? That's why, friends, our identity power is loosening today. It's happening. It's already happening. How do you identify? You think that's an accident? That's no accident. Evolution is taking place whether you like it or not. And that freed up identity power is asking to be placed on something. What will you choose? It's not going to be ordained by anyone. And yet there is a being who is saying, do you love me? Who bears our highest being. Who, in whose presence we feel more ourselves than without. And this, this if you can remember, this fundamental experience that I described to you, that basically meant that I was then committed to going to the Eucharist service every Sunday. When I was 23, I told that story. For some mysterious reason, I was drawn back to the communion service, which I had sworn off at 
15, saying I'm never going to church again, especially not that insane one that come after confirmation. I was drawn back to the Eucharist. No one comes to me unless the Father draws them. And in the communion, as the priest, through the priest, touched my face with the peace, I felt more myself than I ever did before. <clears throat> I felt I had been given my humanity. This is a direct quote, quote from Rudolf Steiner. When you come into the presence of the etheric Christ Jesus, he gives you your humanity. You feel like I've become a real self, a real human. And you know, oh, before I wasn't a real human. And then when that experience goes, I feel I'm lacking my humanity. And then I need to pray. <laughs> Lord, help me feel my humanity again. That's the consecration of humanity. We don't conjure it up ourselves. We don't manifest it ourselves. It is given as a grace. But someone has to receive it freely and recognize it. And choose it and say yes to it. So friends, this is the mystery we're dealing with. How do we learn more and more to shape ourselves and be in relationship with the one who, who says, I am the light of the world. And I want you to become sons of the light, images of the light, reflections of my being. So we're going to do start with our inner work as we always do, and then we're going to take a step forward in looking at the first activity is the witness, the witness we call the witness or the faithful witness. It's the first activity of the Christ in you. So let's do our inner work. And this time today, I'd like to do the one we sometimes do, where it's given by Rudolf Steiner this imagination of hearing Christ's words as we imagine him in our presence. So first we'll come into silence and just try to be aware of your own consciousness, your own attention as quietly as you can. <laughs> if, if little voices come up, like what am I gonna do today or Whatever, just notice them and let them go. Just try to be awake in stillness. And then we'll turn to the imagination that I'll guide. So turn slightly away from your screen. If you're in front of the screen, take a deep breath and come into stillness, awake stillness. And now try to imagine Christ before you, who speaks into your heart. Let your soul be carried by my strong power. I am with you. I am in you.
I am for you. I am your true I. Good. Slowly come back. Welcome to those who have just come on. Remember, dear friends, last time, I just want to say a brief word about it. Last time, the, we, we drew out a diagram of the big picture. Remember, in the beginning, the human being was the, hum, the image and likeness of God. The I am, our I, was the image and likeness of God, the image and likeness. And then this I am was infected by the fall, twisted, got the potential to become egotistical and over-identified with what is not itself. Those are the two sickness elements that came in through the fall. If we had remained in our pure state, we would always identify as an image and likeness of God, and we would be that would all we would be. But that's not what occurs and what happens. We identify as all kinds of things. How did that happen? It happened because the fall infected our identification power and our sense of self. Our sense of self, A, doesn't get lost in our thinking, feeling, and willing. I still can feel that I am a super cool being, even though I have all kinds of weird thoughts. I can identify with the fact that I am hungry. That wasn't possible in the beginning. We would just see hunger, like a perception, like a chair. Oh, it's there. I wouldn't identify myself with I am hungry. Or what's more, identify myself as an anti whatever, masker, whatever. The very fact that I can identify with an ideology or a, I identify as a Christian, if it's an ideology, and then I can defend that ideology, the very fact that that's possible is because of the fall. The I can over-identify itself with thoughts, feelings, and will impulses. That was a gift from Lucifer. Thank you, Lucifer. Why is it a gift? Because it helps us to find a sense of separate self. If you're just an image and likeness of God, you don't have much sense of separateness. We needed to find that separateness to be free. But now the question is, what will help us find our fulfilled I? So part of this I am, this true I am, had to come down and provide a medicine, become present with us, to reorientate us back to our true self. And that happened at Golgotha. That happened with the incarnation of the true human, the true image and likeness of God. That's why Paul says, Christ Jesus is the image and likeness of the unseen God. So in looking at him and in hopefully growing his being in us, 
we take this journey to the fulfilled I am. The fulfilled I am. Which is different than the beginning because now it's what? What's added that wasn't there before? Freedom. <clears throat> and love. Because you can't actually have real love without freedom. But this isn't guaranteed. And so there's a, there's a counter process that leads the eye to identify and become a counter image. This is why in the last book of the Bible, there's the beast and the lamb. Because the beast is also wanting our I am. The beast is also wanting us to say yes and conform to its image and likeness. And that's why Christ always says in this journey, who is with us? Do you love me? Doesn't say you must love me. Do you? He doesn't want an automaton. He wants someone who freely loves. And why love him? Because love... Love is the power that allows freedom to be there, but also then what we love starts to shape us, form us. We start to become what we devote ourselves to. What you put your attention on starts to shape you. So this is just a little brief word about this journey. We're we're now here and we're trying to find how can we orientate ourselves, our self, to the true image and likeness so that we can become in its image and likeness, Christ Jesus. Is. And there are seven of these pictures. And we said, I, I named them last time, the witness is number one. This is seven activities of Christ Jesus that are calling us to be guided by them, by him, and like seeds in us trying to grow and bear fruit. The witness, the becoming one, the wounded healer, the disciple, the shepherd king, the overflowing cup, and the bride. the bride. So we're on the witness. And I promised you, oh, I erased Christ in you. Is that bad? Christ. I can write it up again. I can write it up again. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So we're going to go to about 1130, and then we'll open up for questions. And we're going to start with the witness. The witness. What is the witness? Christ is a witness. He's called the faithful witness in the last book of the Bible. Christ himself. What is he witnessing? Our misdeeds. Our misdeeds, says Karen, melancholically. Our sin. Yes. He knows your sin better than you do. Totally, 100%. And he doesn't condemn it. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go and try again. Sin no more. Like he says to the adulteress caught in the middle. But fundamentally, Christ, the faithful witness, we start to see that revealed in the John Gospel already in chapter 4. Before the adulteress. Where we read things like this, Jesus said to them, this is chapter 4 of John. I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord. But the son only does what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. For the father loves the son. 
and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these he will show him so that you may have wonder. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son. That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and trusts, in him who sent me has eternal life. So you get a little bit of a feeling there. What? Christ Jesus as the son is a, a witness. He's simply, you could say, observing what the father is doing. And that's what he's doing. He's in an intimate relationship with a being that is other than him. And he's trying to be shaped by that relationship. Does he say, I'm going to judge because I'm righteous? No. The faithful witness says, I've been bestowed upon the power to judge by something greater than me. You see, he's modeling for us what we are to become. Except we are to do the same thing he's doing with the Father, with Christ Jesus. You see, I can do nothing on my own as a priest. I only try to do what I see Christ do. I hope you're getting the point there. The human being, as Christ reveals, Christ is the human being. He reveals our true nature when he's saying, look, I... I, as the model human being, don't do anything on my own. I only do what I see God doing. I only, yeah, I am trying to be an image and likeness of the Father. That's what the human being is destined to become. So that's why, for example, in the priest ordination, it says, when you see, when this person now works and moves and speaks in your congregation, it's Christ working and speaking and moving in your congregation. Just as when we see Christ, we see the Father working. You see that activity? But it depends on your witnessing power, Christ's witnessing of the Father. This also depends on how strong your witnessing is to Christ, whether or not you can be a vessel for him. So we also see this witnessing in John the Baptist. John the Baptist, in a way, is a more earthly representative of, of the human being. In, in a way, even when it speaks about John the Baptist in the Bible, it doesn't say John was a man. It says the human, anthropos. So there's something universal about John. And he says, I am not the Christ. I have come to bear witness to the Christ. Again, pointing to this part in us that is meant to be moonlike. Not the sun, but reflecting the light of the sun. Okay, so now we're going to bring it right down into an, an earthly story. Remember this, this fellow 
of course, wonderful human being who's become quite a teacher and a popular spiritual teacher in our time, Eckhart Tolle. <clears throat> Eckhart Tolle. He's an extremely, maybe one of the most popular spiritual teachers in our time. And while there are lots of problematic aspects to his teaching, his fundamental kind of enlightenment experience is extremely helpful to understand the witness. Yeah? Extremely helpful. So his story goes like this. Eckhart was a very accomplished, intelligent human, but he was struggling with depression in his earlier midlife. It was kind of a midlife crisis. And he would, he would go through bouts where he couldn't get out of bed. I don't know if anyone can relate to that. But he, he was so depressed, he couldn't get out of bed. And he describes that in, at the worst moments, it would, he would vacillate between experiencing total numbness, like he just couldn't feel anything, and feeling like he just despised himself so much he wanted to die. Numbness, despising. Numbness, despising. And he would vacillate in, in his de depressions between these two. Until finally one day, he had an experience. And it went like this. He started saying to himself, I just can't bear myself anymore. He was in one of these vacillating numbness and despising and he and he just it hit him i just can't bear myself anymore i just can't it's like i can't take it uncle i'm done and he kept saying this to himself inwardly i just can't bear myself anymore i just can't bear myself anymore i just can't and in the structure of the language, he started to have a kind of inner sunrise. Let me put it that way. I just can't bear myself anymore. I just can't bear myself anymore. And he started gradually to experience that his I and his self were different. Remember, because of Lucifer, normally, our I and our self are... If you're hungry or you're angry, you're totally locked into that. But actually, your I is not your anger. Your I is not your hunger. Your eye is not all the thoughts that arise in your brain. It can behold them as objects. This is spirituality 101. Without this capacity, you can do nothing on the path of development. Zero. Because you will always be projecting or over-identifying. So back to Eckhart, I, he kept saying this, and it became like a mantra until it revealed its secret in itself, and he had an awakening. He experienced his I like a sun rising up over the earth that was his self. What was his self there? My self that I cannot bear. Okay, his double, all the things. But what was he experiencing? The sun. No. Oh. His, his eye was like the sun, but the earth was like filled with numbness and self-despising. 
That's what he, I cannot bear myself. What's the self he cannot bear? The fact that I myself is always numb or in despising myself. He started to stand before the self that was simply filled with these very difficult feelings. And in the experience of beholding it, he realized that's not me. That's just what I'm being burdened with right now. Myself is actually a son that can behold whatever is in its consciousness. Are you with me? This was his huge enlightenment. This is what made this experience that he wrote lots of books on and now he's super famous. Is he happier now? He's ha is he happier now? I'm sure he's happier now. Yeah. So what he experienced is the witness freeing itself, disentangling itself from its soul life, double life. And started to experience I am a being, my I is a being that is called to become aware of myself all the time. And I can now choose what I give my attention to, what I shine my inner sun on. I don't have to be locked into obsessing over my numbness and self-despisingness. I can choose to shift the attention. So this is very important, friends. I want to build now our work with the witness on this experience. I hope you're following. The witness is what we work on, many people work on, when, they, when they're so-called meditating. But it's problematic because if it's an end in itself, then it can create problems of egotism and yeah. So this is, this is the key. So the witness self is not God. And this is where then Eckhart goes a little bit, I would say off track. He then calls this witness self basically God in you. But in reality, that witness self is just now has a task. How can it become a moon and turn toward the true sun and fill itself with its light? Yeah. So it's not to, um, I hope you see the value there. The I, the I consciousness is actually attention power. And the attention power is meant to be strong enough to see and bear itself without crumbling. This is also in, by the way, in the anthroposophical esoteric path. All of your meditation is simply to build up the strength to behold your double, which is you. Behold it with what? Your eye consciousness, your witness self. And then gradually learn to transform that double through the power of the greater guardian. Yeah. So I want to call this first experience of the, of the witness self. Remember, it's kind of like a child. Have you ever had a baby? I've had a baby, three. Mm -hmm. And you know how in the beginning, their consciousness is kind of like, you can feel it, it's kind of out here. And even like gradually, like they're laying and then, then all of a sudden they do that and they're like looking at their hand like it's this mean other. Like, how dare you hit me? Think about that. Their, their witness is still in beholding mode. It doesn't yet know this is me. It's just like, hmm, this is a weird object. 
you see, and you can see the process of the I coming down and gradually identifying with the body, with the feelings. This is, we're talking about now the reverse process. You don't get this experience of Eckhart at 21. That means your I being has fully identified healthfully with your earthly reality. There's a new process then that has to take place. It's called the liberated witness. First, I'm gonna call that the liberated, liberated witness or I. Witness is another word for I consciousness. Not yet true I. So we're reversing the kind of incarnational identification by disentangling ourselves from our thoughts, feelings, and even body. You are not your body. You're not your memories. Those things can become perceptions that your I being beholds. Reactivity to what's in your soul is not witnessing. Blaming and scolding and whipping and accusing is not witnessing. You know the liberated witness when you're able to feel at peace, a certain kind of peace with what is arising. This is why the great meditants are so interested in this being in us, because it can just behold what arises and falls in consciousness. And there's a certain type of peace in that. The liberated witness. This is the first step. I want to give three steps of this I being, this witness being in us. I learned this liberated witness when I was a, 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 an aspiring Zen Buddhist. That was my first love. 17 years old, trying to sit zazen, practicing Aikido. I was on track. And I had some profound experiences of a kind of consciousness that is simply observing whatever arises and falls in consciousness. And there's a certain type of peace that can come when you're in that state of liberated witnessing. But then in my journey, the question came, well, how do I know what's real? Is all of this just Maya, really? Am I the only thing in existence, my consciousness? Really? Is that really true? I couldn't believe it. And so I went on a journey and I met some teachers who were able to bridge Zen practice with anthroposophical meditation. Turns out the spiritual world, if you learn to cross the abyss of Maya, is populated by beings other than you. And you can know them. They're not, they don't have to be relegated to mere projections of your inner psychology. But that path has to be taken by the eye. You see, the most popular form of spirituality now, right now, says your liberated eye consciousness is God. I'm talking about even people, all kinds of people that are all kinds of religions. And the work is to just let go of the layers to find that you're God. But there's no relationship with a real other being. That's all illusion. That's the pitfall of remaining in the liberated witness. If this is your final destination, it's going to be problematic because you'll be alone endlessly. This is just a preparation to be able to turn your gaze in the loneliness of the desert to, to the one 
who holds your true self. I am not the light. I have come to bear witness to the light, the true light that is coming into the world. That's what John says, who represents our our humanity. So it's very important then that this liberated witness take another step to what I call the strong witness. You, O Christ, said to those walking with you, I stand at peace with the world. This peace with the world can be with you also because I give it to you. Therefore, make strong, O Christ, that in me. What's that in me? That in me which rests itself free from the load of sin. And in thinking and willing joins with you. Remember Eckhart Tolle's story. He was rested free from the load of sin. Which was his numbness, self-despising. To liberate that in me. But now in our prayer we're saying make strong that in me which can rest itself free from the load of sin. And join with you. And receive peace. So this strong one, this one is first witness is trying to liberate itself from the chains of its thinking, feeling, and willing that has swamped it, made it reactive. The next step is to learn to be able to move this witness in us, be strong enough to rest ourselves free from that obsession with our darkness and receive strength from another. Or receive strength from something like a mantra that we choose to think about. Rudolf Steiner points this out in How to Know Higher Worlds. He says, if you're, if you're experiencing impatience in your inner life as you meditate or whatever you're doing, He says, it's not helpful to just scold yourself or say, now I have to be patient. He says, you actually have to realize, first see your impatience, and then willfully turn your attention to another thought and focus on that other thought that actually has, that's actually fruitful and helpful. This other thought, he says, for example, I must do everything I can do to further the development of my soul and spirit, but I will wait calmly until higher powers have found me worthy of enlightenment. That's the thought. I will do everything I can do to to develop further and... I will wait calmly. You see, the the, the thought in there is that actually any true progress is a gift from the spirit. It's not your accomplishment. I will wait calmly until the higher beings determine I'm worthy for the next step. So instead of fretting about your impatience or beating yourself up, you're to see it, rest yourself free, liberated witness, and then turn to something hopeful. In this case, it's another type of thought that actually can guide you well. In the sacrament case, it's a being. The strong witness is the one who receives strength from Christ in order to put their attention, put our attention on him in order to stand at peace with the world and unite with the world's evolving. You see, so what is the I? What is this weird that in me that 
What is this I in us? It's like a tree. It's rooted in our thoughts, feelings, and will impulses, but it can be too rooted. And it's also meant to receive higher light and transmute that light into helpful energy and oxygen for others. The eye is a conduit. The witness is a conduit. A free conduit. In a way, it's like that icicle right there. I wouldn't see that quality of light, that gleaming of the light, had that icicle not been a conduit for the sun into my own sight here. The eye is meant to learn to clear itself up from its entanglements so that it can receive divine light in order to transform its own being, but also to shine out for others and for the world, like a diamond. So this is the strong witness. This is the witness that can then not just free itself from its entanglements and not react, but learn to receive strength from God and also learn to direct its attention to what's helpful. Have you ever laid in bed at night and thought, these thoughts that I keep going over and over again are not helping me? They're actually, I think they're not that useful. <laughs> but you can't do anything about it because you're stuck in a little rabbit uh, hamster wheel. That means your, your witness is not strong yet. So what do you do? You've got to strengthen it through inner exercises of liberating quality, but also pray, Lord, give me the strength to wrest myself free from this thought pattern and help me find one that's healthy. You can't just turn your attention to a vacuum, dear friends. Have you ever tried that? Okay, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think. Don't think about an elephant right now. Don't think about an elephant. Don't picture an elephant. Don't do it. You're all picturing yes, an elephant. Yes. You see, it doesn't attention, witness power doesn't work like that. You have to actually willfully put something helpful in your consciousness to focus on. So if you find yourself trapped in a system of repetitive thinking that you know is not going to give you life, pray for strength and put something helpful in your consciousness to think about. <laughs> That's the strong witness. How much time do we have left? Oh. Is there an example to that? Eight minutes. Is there an example to that? I just gave one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rest yourself free from weariness and pay attention. I must do every, if I'm impatient, I'm experiencing impatience, put this thought into your consciousness. I must do everything I can do to further the development of my soul and spirit but I will wait calmly, quietly, until higher powers have found me worthy for the next step. Focus on that thought. Yeah? Or if I'm fretting about things I can't control, I can simply pray. Just focus on a helpful prayer or read the Bible and try to rest my mind free from what I keep trying to obsess about. Every time I do that, it's like going to the, met, the witness gym. It's not LA Fitness, but it's the, it's the witness gym. Every time I'm able to say, okay, I'm going to think about this and not that, you're doing some reps. 
you'll find that you don't have the strength to do that. So therefore, make strong, O Christ, that in me, my witness, which can rest itself free. We need his strength to be strong witnesses. You see? So this is a director. Uh, I don't know what that, that's a little symbol of direction. But that's not enough. You can't just be a strong witness. You have to be a faithful witness. Faithful. Can you see that? I don't know. Faithful witness. So the next evolution is not just being strong and learning to direct yourself. It's learning to be an image and likeness of another, like we saw Christ in the beginning. It's learning to see... It's not me, it's him. My true self is not in me, it's in him. The faithful witness learns to follow and imitate, ingest and become what it's devoted to. This is our mystery. This is the mystery of the eye that it become shaped by and identified with Christ's being, Christ Jesus's. That's why at the center of the John building, the Gertianum is called the Johannesbau. The very center is what? The true human being, Jesus that we're meant to focus on so that we can become in the image and likeness of. Good. Well, is there anything else? I think that's, I think that's enough for today. So just a little recap. Remember, this is the first expression of how the Christ in you is trying to to work, and it first comes alive when we free our own self from what it's entangled in, then gradually learn to direct that witness self and receive strength to do so through prayer, in order then eventually to begin to more and more become a faithful witness that I, finds its true being, identifies itself in and with Christ Jesus in a relationship and learns to shape its own inner potential in that light. So that when I see Ronnie, more and more I want to see Christ Jesus in, in a particular nuanced color expression that only Ronnie can do. And when I see Gia, I want to see a revelation of God, Christ Jesus, in only her particular way. You see, so then my witnessing is also directed toward others. That's the goal, too. I'm not obsessed with myself. That means I'm not a liberated witness. And the more I see Christ in others... the more delight that I have in my life. Think about how delightful it is to be in the presence of God. But the more I tear others down and despise others, think about how terrible my life is going to be. You see, joy is seeing God. <laughs> Loving God. And it's possible. All right, friends. So let's, let's, uh, let's take our uh, time now. We have about 30 minutes. And I see already two questions, three questions. So we'll go... Joanna, 
Ronnie, and then Christine or Christoph, whoever that is, and then Susan. <laughs> okay. Hi, Jonah. Thank you. This is a quick clarification. It's actually kind of from last week, and it may have even been from your other class, but I think you can answer it quickly. Um, <clears throat> I heard last week, I thought, something about spirit of the world as Araman, but I've started to serve, and I know that line, you know you are going to the service, that is to lift up your soul to the spirit of the world. Did did I misunderstand? Did you at some point use spirit of the world for Araman? And could you just give me that demarcation? Sure. Great question, Joanna. I'm so glad. <laughs> Actually, someone asked me that. A new person that came and went to the children's service kind of fresh heard that. And they were a kind of, they were a traditional Christian. And why are you lifting up the souls of the to the spirit of the world, that's the devil, she said to me. And I said, oh, right. So this is a good question because yes, the spirit of the worldly world, if you wanna put it that way, we know he offered all of this world to Jesus if you would just bow down to me. Paul talks about the spirit of the world in his letters as the devil. Do not conform yourself to the world, but conform yourself to the kingdom of God that is present in the world. So it is a tremendously important distinction. However, <laughs> when we say it in the children's service, we mean the spirit of God's world in the material world. That means the kingdom of God on earth world, the hidden in plain sight world, the Shambhala world, the etheric Christ's world, whatever you want to call it. But it's not Araman's world that we're trying to lift the kids up to. However, it's still possible to very concretely use the spirit of the world as an indication for Arama. Yeah. So I hope that I, I hope that clears it up a little bit, Joanna. Yeah, I thought probably like that, but I just wanted to hear you yeah, it's specifically a great... say it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very good question. Oops. Okay, who's next? Uh Ronnie and then Christine. Uh, so actually, I, it's not really a question, but more of an observation about the faithful witness. So those of us who've had the privilege of being early childhood teachers have seen the most incredible faithful witnesses. And like th those children mm. are watching us like that, just knowing what I'm saying. Mm. Like they, they are completely wanting to be in our image and likeness and and, and it's a real um responsibility actually but it but it's such a good example of what i think we're being called to do in a way not not that we're trying to emulate somebody but 100%. but they're just so devoted in that 100 percent. it's such a good example so ronnie just made this comment that early childhood educators kindergarten teachers Etc. Are, are dyed in the wool in this mystery of imitation on how children want to imitate the teacher and and in a way become like the teacher, right? I remember how much I loved my kindergarten teacher. I just thought she was like the angel of God on earth. I was in love with her and. Of course, I did everything imitating. Yeah. So there's a there's a, a deep picture. In a way, we start with that as children, but we have to end with that as adults, but this time consciously and in much more of an inner battle with the adversary, right? The children just get whatever you give in the environment. They're not consciously battling their inner dragon yet even though it'll come but that's a good picture that if you imagine the faithful witness 
as now conscious in me, deciding to be like a child again? Yeah, they have a saying about that. The inner past is actually as a child become um was unconsciously trust and become becoming the whole process of inner trust is becoming consciously trust yeah. and enjoy and also see the beauty of the world. That's it. Unless you be actually going back to the child. Consciously and freely. Unless you become like a child again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Now that's the mystery. So very good. Thank you for that. Okay, next, Christine. Howdy. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be a moon to your son. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and just uh, add a couple of, uh, of things. So that came to my mind um, that may be a little bit of an aha to myself. So um, to begin with, the liberated witness liberates itself from a what how how do I okay the difference is that the faithful witness is a choice of identification and mm. so much in our life is a an unconscious identification mm. so that when we think about uh the things well, the whole identity crisis, in a sense, right now, where people are uh, breaking themselves down into smaller and smaller categories of really uh, um, saying, who am I? It's, I think it's a search for who am I? And, and they're, they're, but it's it's less it's not a conscious choice. It is something that's determined by biology, or an internal, an internal desire, or or drive, or whatever. Um, and that the faithful witness is one that chooses what to identify with. And uh, so that's number one. The second uh, point is just. Um, I was at a workshop once with Cynthia Bourgeau. I don't know if you know who she is. She is a mystic in the Anglican tradition. And she was talking about monkey brain and how, you know, when you try to meditate and all these intrusive thoughts and that, you know, somebody said, you know, how was your meditation? Oh, it was terrible. Uh, you know, and it had hundreds of thoughts going through. And she said, think of them as hundreds a hundred opportunities to turn towards God. <laughs> and, you know, what you were saying, it's practice, right? That when you have thoughts, it's practice of turning your attention to the one. So that in the world, too, we have practice turning towards God. So that's all. That's my moon thoughts. That's your moon thoughts. <laughs> Thank you for your moon thoughts and your moon shining. And the word is turning. Yeah, turning. Yeah. So that's also a wonderful example. This hundreds of opportunities to turn to God. Think about that. Remember how often I say, what if all of your sufferings, all of your difficulties were birth pains? Birth pains. What if you saw all of the problems and difficulties as opportunities to become new in God? That's an orientation that only you can do. God can't do it for you even. Yeah. So that's wonderful. And also, I just want to say in terms of this freedom that Christine talked about, the freedom of the faithful witness to choose to turn and identify with God is certainly true. But there's also a freedom here to choose what you put your mind on already. The strong witness is the one who can, if the, if the thoughts at night are just, blah, 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 how can I rest myself free? Well, I need help with prayer and I need another helpful thought and I need the will to do it. And that all has to come out of a free space as well. And in this 
experience, the liberated witness, freedom is felt as liberation, literally. Like Eckhart felt, oh my gosh, it's a, it's a realization to say, I'm not that. And I don't have to be fully invested in that as me. That gives you a feeling of liberation. So freedom indeed has its evolution in these as well. But make no mistake, friends, the fact that we're all struggling with who are we and what is our identity doesn't mean that we are, if we're free in that, doesn't mean it's guaranteed to be placed on God. I can be freely identifying with something that is not God. So let's not idealize freedom of choice because it's not, it's, it's, a, it's just as much of a problem as it is a blessing. Have you ever heard the problem of the psychological problem of choice? This is an interesting study. Psychology, you know, now, you know, I have a degree in psychology, so I have a little orientation to it. But they found, and this is relevant for our time, that the more choices you have, this has to do with wealth. The more choices that are placed in front of you, my, my wife grew up in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, when, where they had one choice of toothpaste at the store. Colgate, that's it. There was not a thousand different toothpastes to choose from. But the more choice you have, I could do this, I could do that, I could, the less satisfaction you have in that choice. So think about us, all of us rich people. We're all exceptionally rich, by the way, because we have all kinds of choices. The more choice you have, the less satisfaction you have in what you choose. Isn't that weird? That's just one layer of a psychology, yeah? But it's, it's something to grapple with. It begs the question, where does purpose and meaning and fulfillment really come from? It does not come from freedom to choose whatever you want. That's the main point. That's not real freedom, but it's a step in the evolution of freedom. I see you, hold on. Okay, we've got Susan. Michael, and then, oh, okay, just quickly then. Is it quick or is it a longer? Okay, so, but hold the thought, Kevin. Okay, so Susan is next, and then Michael. Hi, thank you, Jonah. Um, I was taking what you're talking about today and thinking of a couple of weeks ago when you were talking about the need for us to learn to want to sacrifice mm. the love of ourselves for Christ. Mm. And I was sort of thinking, is this what the intention is of this, all of this, uh, these seven steps, so that freely within that set of what we can do freely, we can then choose to do this. Yes. <laughs> is that the question? <laughs> I have more. <laughs> oh, you have more. Okay. Maybe one. Oh, no, 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 no. This will be enough. If you could get to make, okay, it, make sense. Yeah. It begs the question, okay, yes, the purpose is to love Christ. And so we're to choose to love Christ. How? What's the motivation? If I just love Christ because this priest with a bald head tells me so, or I love Christ because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show everyone that I'm good, or I love Christ because otherwise, if I don't, I'll burn in hell. What motivates me? Fear? Egotism? Selfishness? Wanting to be loved by others? There's only one motivation that we're all struggling to find. And I mean all of us. This is not some switch that you can just turn on. 
the only, the only healthy choosing is because I love it. How do you love God? You can only love something you find beautiful. You can only love something you find beautiful. You can only love something you find truly true. You can only love some, but something you find truly good. So you see how it's, it's not easy to love God. Oh yeah, let's just love Christ. It's not easy. If you love the cross, if you love crucifixion, have you found the beauty of the cross? Has it started to bless you with, with its own reality and motivate you to think about it more and more? <laughs> These are the questions. And this is a tremendous journey that we're all on because most of our motivations have to do with other factors. Am I loved? Am I liked? What's gonna put me in good stead? Fear stuff, identity stuff. So friends, this is not an easy switch. It's just a gradual, it's a prayer. Lord, help me to learn to love you, to know you, to experience your beauty. The only reason why I am not putting up my kids for adoption <laughs> is because I, I'm, I'm entranced, I'm in love with this beauty that is also a potential in them that gives me the strength to endure their hellion beastliness. That's, a, that's just a real factor. It's a real reality. And, and their, their hellion beastliness is nothing when, when, the, when the love for them is in me. It's nothing. I'll endure it for a, a thousand years. That's what love is. And that's what love is when it's connected to the beauty of human becoming, which is God. Good. All right. So next we have uh, Michael and then Kevin and then Irene. Yes, Jonah. Um, I'm hoping that you can address the um, this power of the eye. It, more in mysticism, but particularly in the East, we have figures like Ramakrishna. We also have Rumi. Uh, a whole you, you could name dozens of, of mystics that we know of who identify with God and some aspect of God. There's even green Tara. You know, there's a whole range of types of meditation that you could do. You could, ideally, you go into retreat and you focus on this great love of God. And usually that brings about a, a sense of bliss. It's not very popular in the West, um, but I think it's it's all over this Eastern culture, particularly earlier centuries. What would you say about that? Great question, Michael. So there's two there's two streams, so to speak, in the Eastern mysteries, as far as I've found. And one of the streams leads to the identification that the witness self is God. This isn't the highest stream, though. The other stream is related to something called bhakti yoga, which you're, which you're pointing to, which is the, the love for God as other, the beloved, as Rumi calls him in some of his poetry. And the devotion to this other as God is the path, bhakti yoga, path of devotion to the other. Yeah? So, like you said, Michael, it's not very popular in the West because the West has been enchanted with the, with I would call it the counter stream, this stream that has really been co-opted by the adversarial spirits and Westernized that says, 
that in me that is the witness is not to be devoted to another, but it's to realize its own divinity. Some, some tr traditions, even people like um, Deepak Chopra have called it the Christ consciousness. You, you can't imagine how popular Deepak Chopra is, by the way. He is so popular. And he says there's a third Jesus, and that's your own I, your own self. You are to become a Christ consciousness bearer like Jesus, but certainly don't devote yourself to Jesus. You see the difference there? So the devotion path is certainly there in the East. And it's, it's certainly there in many different traditions, but it's not popular and it's, it's very hidden in the West because worship is, worship is a bad word. <laughs> Even in our circles. To worship, to be subservient? No. I want to be an accomplished, developed I. Yeah, that's really what's, and that has its birthplace. Even Steiner himself referred to it. I just found it in the fifth gospel. He refers to this Californian movement that is distorting the picture of Jesus as he is talking about Jesus revealed in the fifth gospel. And it's, I, I come from California. I ought to know, my mom's a nurse. <laughs> so this is really, this, this overtaking what is actually a devotional path that you can see the Christ impulse in someone like Rumi's poetry. That it's all about the, the, the beloved and becoming aware of the beloved. That's the Christ impulse. Revealing itself in a, in a kind of um, Arab Islamic Milieu. We have to have the eyes to see, though. Most of our spirituality, though, today, the popular spirituality, even if you go to the East, I went to Vietnam and Hanoi and taught 60 different Waldorf teachers, all about young, young people. And this witness manifesting your own reality, Western distortion was everywhere there. It's everywhere. Just like consumerism is everywhere. It's destined to be everywhere because it's the religion of consumerism. New age spirituality that says the witness is God is blessing consumerism. Never before in human history has that happened. Okay, anyway, next question. <laughs> um, Kevin, I think you're next. When you're talking about the psychology study, it says the more choice, the more satisfaction. Mm. The level of satisfaction, however, is a choice. Mm. It sucks. And I know I've been covering this, let's say, last year when I was going to go to the box of pants. Yeah. So you don't go to the box of pants. Oh, my. Talk about choice. <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a you know, silly example, but we perfectly said, no, you know what? We knocked off at 95%. We're going to choose from these three. And got rid of all the other stuff. You know, we had, you know, criteria that we done. But you can do that in anything, right? Where you say, you know, so there's so much choice that it drives me crazy. So let's focus on what's really it helps you actually determine what's really important to you. Beautiful. So doing that allows you to choose to be more satisfied when you get rid of those choices. Beautiful. So Kevin just Kevin just broke down for us how to how to work with the psychology that I talked about of too much choice. So I'll just try to paraphrase. And he says. This is a problem. If you have too much cho choice, any choice you make in that milieu is going to leave you less satisfied. But then he says, well, what about the fact that you're obsessed with wanting to be satisfied? 
So in a way, he's saying, if you do make a choice and you realize you're not satisfied, that's a great awakener. It's a great opportunity to then ask yourself, well, what really does peace, where does true satisfaction come from? What is my life about? What am I doing at the store? Why am I even buying this silly pot? So that you can start the process of this journey to what does, where does the human self find peace, true fulfillment? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, next, Irene. And then I, I, th I think I see John Fraser's hand up. When, when you talk about your children and the love that you feel, you'll experience over and over and over again the abuse. So we have a sense of that love. And if we have that sense of that love in others, it's another step. And when we have experienced the love of Christ, the motivation is heightened. Mm. The motivation to love your kids or to love Christ or to, to love them. others, all of them. Yeah. Amen. So Irene says, uh, she says, true love is infectious. When we, when we know it in ourselves, when we know it in, in others, when we know how God loves us, it amplifies it. When we've experienced even a drop of Christ's love for us, we cannot help but love others. It's, it's infectious. It really is. It's like a candle that, that is then able to light a million different candles. And then all of a sudden from one little fire, you've got a thousand flames. It's not a scarcity issue. It's not like God's love, he gives you a little bit and then he has less. <laughs> He gives you a little bit and then it grows. It's the opposite of scarcity psychology. <laughs> it's abundance. This is why Christ says, look, I'm here so that you have life in abundance. But not because of your own manifesting power. That's an abomination. Because you've received his abundance and then can be a conduit for others. Good. All right, one more. Oh, Galena, you're always, you always get the best questions, but I only think we have one, one more. Anyway, let's see how long John's question is. John, go for it. I don't really have a question and it's gonna be quick. Oh. Um, going back to the very first question that was asked, um, I wanted to just differentiate uh, Christ from Araman in a, in a way that's been helpful to me. And that, so using the words that were framed in the question as the world spirit is Christ. So the prince of this world is Araman. Mm. Christ Great. is the world. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, thank you, John. That's that's a good way to 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 distinguish it through naming. It was helpful to me. Okay. Yeah, thank you. The, yeah, I'll repeat it. So so John is saying that the spirit of the world you can understand as Christ because it's the true world. The prince of this world is Araman. So that's for him how he distinguishes in the, with those labels. Still a little bit of a challenge, but nevertheless. Okay. Well, because the prince, the prince, the prince has a limited domain. That's ah. the difference. Okay. Nice. 
Yeah, you could. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, one more, and then we'll stop. We're going to go to if, three more minutes. Okay. It, it, be, it has to be concise, though, Colleen. I will try my best. Okay. To <laughs> okay. So there's a professional uh, psychologist with a degree in psychology, uh, and you study. And what I showed between uh, weaknesses, uh, liberated and playful weaknesses, if I take away God or Christ or, or ego, I am, it is a lot of similarity with the mindfulness, which is a very popular right now, with the cognitive behavior therapies, or with any actually therapeutic groups. Your comments about it. Okay, so Galina asked differences. So Galina asked, what's the similarity and differences between this, what I'm describing, this liberated, strong, and faithful witness to mindfulness practice that's very popular to them. And certain cognitive psychologies, therapies, that work in this way. If you take away God and Christ and ego, maybe they're similar, maybe, or how are they different? It's a very good question. Essentially, just to be brief, because I want to be, we have to end, but a good psychologist, and, and Christoph would know this, a good psychologist is trying to help. He's, the good psychologist is standing in place of your liberated witness. He's acting as your liberated witness until you can be strong enough to, to bear witness to, to your own being. A good psychology helps you find this state of being. But if you stay in that state, it doesn't, it, it can become a prison. But it's, a, it's a, a very important step on the journey. A good psychologist, a poor psychologist will keep you trapped in certain thoughts. A good psychologist will help you find the liberated witness actually. But then a strong witness inevitably comes to the need that I don't have enough. The witness doesn't have enough. So there's only one way to get more if you don't have enough. It's called prayer. And that's where we leave the realm of also mindfulness. Mindfulness is just strengthening that in us to become conscious. And the spiritual gurus of it have decided that that mindful witness is God. So that's, a, that's an abomination. That's an error. But it's still helpful to build the strength of that witness if it can then take the next steps, you see? It's not saying mindfulness is all bad, no. But if it concludes that the witness is God, it becomes bad. But the very mindfulness practice, you cannot take any steps without strengthening your mindful witness. Zero, you won't go anywhere. So that's why I brought the story of Eckhart Tolle as a step, a vital step along the way. But just like anything, if you stop at development of an eight-year-old and you're 50, is that a problem? Yes. <laughs> oh, so it's very similar. but. The spirituality, either you get locked in to, a, to a, a kind of psychology that keeps you in a certain place, or the spirituality says the witness is God, and that stunts your growth. But the activity of becoming aware of the liberated self that a psychologist is trying to help you find, or the witness self that a mindfulness practice is helping you find, is a is a vital step along a healthy path. Good. Okay, hopefully that's, I, I got a, a, a nod. So that's good. All right, friends. So that was a tour de force in the witness. 
Next time, next week, we'll go into the becoming one, the becoming one. Blessings on your week, and we'll pray next time. You can pray on your own.